Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time to take the global stories that made it to the front pages of our national dailies this morning. And joining us to review the papers is Professor Kamilu Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kanu. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Happy new month to you. I think I'd like to start with that. It's a new month and a new week. Same to you. Yes, sir. Really. And to all our listeners. Yes, that's right. All right, so we'll be starting with The Punch this morning. And this is a story that is not just on The Punch and other papers as well. Um, it says petrol scarcity is set to worsen as NNPCL admits $6 billion debt. Um, the writers here says debt to petrol suppliers has caused financial strain. PMS supply threatened, and that is being said by the NNPC. Petrol queues spread. Motorists lament as fuel marketers decry PMS shortage. On the Daily Trust, it says petrol price may rise as NNPCL admits financial strain. And the writers here says why hike is inevitable. That, that has been said by experts. And article demands listing of all firms on stock exchange. Um, this morning when I was coming to work, as early as 6 a.m., I saw so many cars on the road queuing at petrol stations and looking at the papers i thought to myself this is already worse so if they're saying it is set to worsen i can only imagine what it's going to be like and we know that petrol is one commodity that almost every household needs either you're using it for your cars for transportation um, or you're using it for your generators as an alternative source of power um, but even businesses, they need this same commodity. Why are we not prioritizing this commodity? Um, instead, we're seeing where there's a $6 billion debt. And we're owing. We keep borrowing money for other things which we don't even know about. Um, our lawmakers are splurging on cars and yachts and, you know, changing their, renovating their houses. But for something that we know that affects almost everybody, we're not prioritizing it. What is your take on this? The fact that petrol scarcity is set to worsen, it's already worse. Because even as of two weeks ago, I had to buy for 860 naira per liter. Some people are selling as high as 1,000 naira. You told me that in Kanu, um, you're seeing it at that price range. But as of right now, if it's already this bad, what is going to happen in the next few weeks? You see, we have to put uh, the whole thing in context. Uh, it has been the old strategy in the book mm. that whenever there is an attempt to raise the price of uh, oil, yeah. uh, artificial scarcity is created mm. and uh, long queues so that the people will be exhausted. By the time the new price comes, they will gladly and welcome it in order to survive. This has right. been the strategy. And this is part of what uh, uh, we are seeing now. Because initially, for about uh, two weeks or so, NNPC has been denying that it owes some money. Mm -hmm. And now uh, it was blaming whether it was blaming other things for the queue. Now it, come out and, uh, it comes out and admit that um, really uh, is owing the supplies up to such uh, amount. And then in, uh, in the same breath, uh, you know, some official come out and say that, look, uh, we cannot afford to sell uh, petroleum below the landing cost. Uh, they say by the time it comes, it is um, 1,117 naira. Okay? So if you add all this in with what has been in the past, the picture, uh, we know you know, we just uh, get ready for... A new price. Um, that is part of it. It is not that they, we don't priori uh, prioritize on the issue, but the fact is that the government is bent on increasing you know, the pump price. So that is why we are hearing all sorts of narratives from the government officials. And now we are being squeezed into, you know, these long queues. Mm. Believe me, yesterday I went around here, the NMPC, uh, a station that is supplying fuel. If you look at the long queue that is there, uh, one will just feel that um, 
the inevitable is coming. And uh, like I told you last week, the average here is 950, 980, and 1,000 naira uh, per, uh, you know, the liter. Uh, there was a time I was going to a TV station and I look, I had problem. I just stopped to buy it. I was told a gallon I have to pay 5,000 naira. And that was what I paid in order to get where I want to go. Wow. So these are the things that the government is creating deliberately in order to hike the price. Mm. So, I mean, it's quite unfortunate that we're a nation that you know is blessed with these natural resources and then we have to be subjected to long queues and a price hike now um my, my question is if they want to increase the price i mean why can't they just come out to say it because for the longest time the nnpcl was denying that there was any subsidy you know being paid and even though we've said it that there should be a quasi subsidy we're going to be looking at the exchange rate every day as it comes so how did they get to owing six billion dollars if you say that you're not paying uh, subsidy how come we're owing six billion dollars that now is even affecting us and we're still not thinking of how to start refining our own products the potakot refinery was well, it was scheduled to um, start operations in August, where in September now, they had to move it. We don't know when they moved that to. Kajuna Refinery is set to start operations in December, but we're not even sure if that's going to happen. So there's just a lot that is going on. It's like a web that I can never understand. So my question is, if they know that they want to increase the price, why can't they just come out straight to tell us, one, and then two, why are we owing $6 billion? Yeah, you see, number one, they, they can't come out and say it like that because they know the implication. Mm -hmm. By the time they uh, increase it uh, subtly like that, uh, there is going to be perhaps a revolt against that one. So that is why I said that it has been an old strategy. What they do is, over the years, is to create this artificial scarcity and pose people uh, so that they are exhausted. By the time new price come out, the people will just accept it and they will not do anything. So that is one of the strategy uh, in the book here in Nigeria. And by the issue, the second question that you said about owing the money. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, it has been, the government has been in denial, okay? that uh, for long, since the very day the president said that uh, uh, that uh, F subsidies subsidy gone. is gone forever, uh, for good. And uh, since then, we had had uh, three different hikes of price. And this is going to be number four, if you, if you follow the trend. Mm -hmm. And uh, the analysts have been saying that, look, we are now paying higher, more subsidy than what we used to pay in the past. Mm. But the government keep on denying, keep on denying. Now they have reached to, you know, their back is a press against the wall and they can no longer uh, take the denial stage. So that is why they come out and say it. The whole thing is there is huge corruption around the system. So that is why we are accruing this huge amount of money. Some people are busy embezzling it. They, it is a cash cow for some few people. So that is why in the first place, when the government says they are going to remove subsidy because some cabal are benefiting from it, we say it is a wrong policy. Why can't you pursue the cabal and then they allow Nigerians to do it, uh, to, to enjoy uh, their lives? But now, the same cabals have now found a new way of embezzling this. So that is why the subsidy, according to so many sources, which the government refused to accept, that we are now paying almost triple the subsidy that we used to pay uh, in, during the subsidy regime. And the other thing, when you talk of uh, Port Harcourt, you are forget to mention also the Dangote refinery. Dangote also, they kept on changing the date, postponing it yeah, about three times, and this is number four. So uh, Port Harcourt too. I mean, I mean for, Dan, for, for, Dan, for Dangote refinery, that is even understandable because it's a private enterprise. It's not owned, fully owned by the government. So I can still understand that. Anyways, on the paper here, it says Dangote refinery petrol ready for rollout. So we're hoping that 
you know, we'll start to see this commodity from Dangote Refinery. But I was going to ask, do you think this is going to have any impact on the price or even the availability? Will Dangote Refinery have the capacity to serve the whole of Nigeria right now, especially with the fact that there are long queues um, at the moment and people can barely see these products? You see, if Dangote Refinery were to function fully, uh, they have the capacity more than a Nigerian need because that is what uh, they say. They, they, they kept on dishing out the figures that what uh, they are going to refine by the day by day is more than Nigeria's need and that they are even going to export it to yeah. other African countries. So I think that is what is going to happen. Whether it is going to change the price or not is another thing because, like I say, there is huge corruption around the policy. So even if they come strong, gradually they will strangle it and force it into, uh, you know, go join the right race. Because otherwise, if domestic refineries are working, logically in simple economics, uh, it, it, the price will come down because you have eliminated one major factor, factor in the in the costs that is transportation. Okay, a landing cost instead of you know paying in that one, you now have it. And the other thing that logically will have bring the cost of the uh, price uh, of petroleum is that they are going to be paid in in naira. I mean, the, the transaction is going to be in naira, not in dollars. But Nigeria being what it is, even if Dangote and other refineries are given the product free of charge. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, because of the huge corruption around it, we are not going to see the price coming down significantly. What we are going to see maybe is a minor thing. If now the government succeeds in, high, in jacking it to 900 plus or 1,000 plus, so by the time the Dangote come out and uh, do it, the worst that will happen is maybe to get about 50 naira uh, down the, what the official government price is. Already government has reached where it wants to go. So these are all part of the politics and the old tricks in order to now jack the price. Mm. Well, let's just move over to another story because with the petroleum sector, it's just it's just a whole lot. And we hope that, I mean, people can even see the products because at this point, I'm sure nobody would really care so much if they have to pay whatever price. If we're already paying as high as 1,000 naira, even if, you know, they officially say that this is the amount, I'm sure people would be willing to pay it. We just definitely want that our source of income is being increased as well. Then we can afford anything. All right, let's move over to the electricity sector. So here on the punch, it says power generation down by 1,400 megawatts as discos reject allocations. So now um, the, the minister had said that they're looking um, to increase the power generation from 5,000-ish. It went down um, by 1,400 megawatts, which is quite unfortunate. And he was saying that most of the discos could not pick up the supply. And, you know, it's a setback because Nigeria is looking to generate about 6,000 megawatts by the end of the year. But if we're still talking about, if we're still, you know, yo-yoing on 4,000 to 5,000 megawatts, and we're seeing um, countries like South Africa, who has a population of barely 60 million people, you know, generating about 70,000 megawatts. What is the setback here in Nigeria? Why can't we generate as much as people need? And, you know, with the discos not even being able to pick up as much supply, of course, this affects many households, many businesses. And the fact that they even recently increased the tariff for Band A customers by over 200 or 300%. Why are we not really looking to ensure that we can generate even more and distribute even more? You see, the, the whole old same story uh, is, is uh, the corruption around it. Even, you know, the way uh, the company was disbanded, uh, you know, is part of the corruption. Some few people who have been uh, in the corridors of power were the ones who are giving uh, uh, this kind of, they, they are the discourse, they were this and they own it. So that is why we are having this problem. That is number one. Number two now, I think they are going to blame the weather. 
that now we have, uh, you know, uh, a torrential the rain rains. all over, and so there is going to be this. Thing. You know, all in Nigeria, when there is drought, they will say the water level is down. Then now when there is rain, they will say it's uh, above the capacity and so on. And uh, besides, I can link this one to, uh, I say, a story by Al Jazeera some times ago. He said, um, if you go to Ajakuta, Ajakuta has uh, about 10 megawatts uh, light there. It is stored and nobody, the government is not using it at all. So you see, if there is a political will to do that, already you have somewhere, it is Nigerian owned and the people are not using it. The government could have tapped that one and now give it to the Nigerians, uh, okay, to Nigerians. But because of the corruption there, that is why all these things are not supplied. And even the generation is more than that uh, posing the poor megawatt that we are talking, or six megawatt that we are talking. The, the, there is a capacity to produce, to generate more than that. Because of the agreement that we enter with all these things, and especially IMF and other things. So that is why more than half of what we are generating is allowed to waste, even from the producer. So these are some of the things that we need to look in deeply if we are to see the, to look at even the real problem why we are where we are now. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> with the electricity companies, I, I think they definitely need to do more and probably invest in, um, you know, proper infrastructure because if we're going to be wasting like you said we're wasting a lot that is even being generated then why are we not looking at investing properly if we're going to keep borrowing because i mean when we borrow we really don't we can't really ascertain what projects they're using it for but i'm sure that if nigerians hear that we're borrowing money to ensure that we have proper stable electricity they wouldn't mind and we know that we can pay after a while so why are we not channeling our funds into certain critical sectors that we know that we need in Nigeria? Yeah, it's, it's because there is, uh, you know, wastages. Uh, you know, this borrowing um, is just one of the strategies that we are using. And the reason why we are where we are now, part of it, Beside the two policies that the government rolled out, that is uh, the removal of subsidy and the plotting of the Naira, mm. the main culprit of all these things is cost of governance. The way we are spending on running the government necessarily is part of the reason. That is why we have to borrow in order to maintain the cost of governance. Okay? That is why we have to increase the taxes in order to maintain the cost of governance. That is why sometimes we print more money in order to pay the cost of governance. So if there is a political will on behalf of the leaders and the government to cut the cost of governance and to look at these twin policies that they have rolled out, I'm sure I will be out of the uh, problem because these are the things that we are not, the, our leaders are not willing to do it. So that is why all other measures will just, well, you know, fizzle out. Because you cannot borrow money and pump it in the, into the cost of governance and you expect uh, something to happen, miracle to happen. Or you cannot increase taxes just in order to pay the cost of governance, and you expect others to work. So these taxes, this cost price that we are seeing increase, petroleum here, electricity, and others, are all part of the means to, you know, keep on running the cost of government. That is, you know, if you look at it in the world, Nigeria is among the most expensive the countries in terms of governance. Hmm. If we are not the past, we cannot be less than the past 5%. Imagine. <laughs> Well, another thing that we are right now, according to Bill Gates here on The Punch, he says Nigeria has second highest rate of food insecurity. Imagine a country that is blessed with so many farmlands, really, really fertile lands uh, that we can grow our own food and even export it. Here we are as the second highest rate 
um, of food insecurity. I want to get your take on this. And I know that one of the issues, obviously, is insecurity because most people cannot you know, access their farms. They cannot go to their farms. But something else that has happened recently, and even in Zamfara State, is you know, the flooding as well. So what can the government do better? at this point to ensure that we're not having, you know, we're not just part of an index like this where we're the highest, um, with the second highest, having the second highest rate of food insecurity. Now, you see, uh, this this figure, what uh, Bill Gates said, may uh, help if other things are, you know, international bodies are drawing the attention of the leaders, maybe they will look at that. But the fact is that, yes, we are the second in terms of food insecurity, but we are the first in terms of hunger in the world. We have overtaken India long uh, ago, mm. uh, despite the, the abundant, uh, you know, land that we have, which is arable, which you can grow virtually any other, anything that uh, we need in Nigeria and even export it. The reason is, yeah, insecurity is part of uh, the major reason why we are having uh, this challenge. Now there is flood and others which add to that. But even before the flood, you know, we have we have been in that position that Bill Gates said and uh, uh, the one I said about hunger. So I think it is all part of uh, the policies of the government. It's all part of uh, the fact that we are in a state of denial. Okay. I, for example, when. Uh, last month, uh, the youth come out, or some people come out and protest about Tanga. This is meant to draw the political leaders, I mean, the leadership attention on the fact that there, is the, there are these problems. But yet, instead of the government to respond, to see what measures we are we going to take, okay? They now uh, take uh, the same measures to suppress the, uh, you know, uh, protesters. And now they are also talking of... Um, maybe dishing out palliatives, as if palliative is what will uh, give lasting solution to the problem. And now they are talking of opening the borders, which, you know, they have the policy, but now it's two months into it, nothing has happened. So these are all part of the denial that we have, which if we are not serious, I mean, and we have not taken different measures, we are not going to see the end of it. So the way out is for the government to look inward and seriously address the issue of insecurity and seriously address the issue of hunger and other things. You cannot, you know, increase transportation, increase, uh, you know, input into agriculture. You increase this and then you expect miracles to happen. Well, like you said, we cannot even expect miracles to happen. We have to do the work. So a lot of people cannot even afford food right now, not just because, you know, of course we do not have the food. I know that they said, like you have rightly said, um, you know, doing the whole import duty thing, but we're not really seeing what the government is doing per se. And it's not just about palliatives. Palliatives is one thing, but what happens next? And if we want to ensure that people can live, you know, their best lives, it's giving them the basic necessities, making sure that they can have food um, on their table. But here now, we do not have as much. And in fact, on the, I was just reading the business NG and it says hard times ahead, food, school, transportation to gulp most income. So, and that is being said by the CBN. So imagine where we are going to. And we're not even seeing what the government is doing to try as much as possible to ensure that we have a better life, especially for Nigerians. Anyways, there's, um, there's a story here that I want to take and it says hunger protest because of course, what I'm speaking about right now is hunger. So the hunger protest that happened, which was also tagged as the end bad governance um, protest, it says here on the punch, hunger protest, federal government arraigns activists, the British ally today um, on the on the Daily Trust, it says, end bad governance um, protesters for trial in Abuja, Kanu, um, Kaduna, and Bornu today. What do you think about this? Because we heard that some of them did not even have legal representation, but then they were, they were charged. I want to get your take on this story. You see, it's part of the diversionary tactics, uh, you know. Uh, the whole issue is that uh, now that uh, after the government has been pushed into 
uh, bringing them out. You remember the, the inspector general went to court and he was given the permission to, uh, you know, remand them for 60 days. And now they are charging these people with uh, treason. And okay, all these things are meant to divert attention on the fact that okay, uh, one there is a real problem of that tanga. That is why people come out. Two, also they are trying to divert attention on the real fact that there are uh, brutalities by the police. Now you see, by the time you are now talking about these things, nobody will talk about those who have been killed. Nobody will talk about those who have been men. So the issue will now focus on this. I think that is a, a dangerous thing, especially, especially given the fact that if you look at the current crop of leaders, they, they have protested several times in the past. From about this time, you know, uh, the issue of June 12th uh, to uh, take back Nigeria and other things. And nobody took such uh, measures on them. But that is why you see uh, human rights organizations have come out to, you know, challenge the government on the issue. I think some of them are going to be uh, represented by Femi Palana, but uh, others in power places, in remote areas. You know, they are just going to be, you know, dealt with according to what the government uh, wish. And I don't think heading up, pushing out uh, this thing is a realistic way of solving the problem. What they are trying to do is to uh, squeeze the issue of protests, uh, to deny it by coming heavily on it, descending heavily on it, but eventually it will amount to like sweeping the dirt under the carpet. Because unless you address the issue of insecurity, unless you address the issue of hunger, inflation, unemployment, and all other things that are bedeviling the country, you are just postponing the inevitable. Mm. Well, hopefully... Um we're trying our best to ensure that everybody, we have a good Nigeria for everyone. Um, on the business end, it leads with federal government to reopen closed borders soon. So we know that in 2019, most, um, most of the land borders were closed, you know, um, because of smuggling and illegal activities. But seeing this now, do you think this would obviously help economic activities in the country, the fact that these borders will be opened? Yeah, you see, in one way it will, uh, uh, you know, ease economic activities because if you look at uh, Nigeria's trade with uh, its own neighbors, with our neighbors, about 90% of it is uh, informal trade, mm. okay, which means transaction across the borders. That one will now be revived. It will be active. Uh, you will see the, the, the business around it. But whether it is going to improve the cost of things is another thing. Because the transaction is already <laughs> in the currencies. Like here in the north, what we are experiencing is that um, people from our neighboring countries, like Niger also comes through Ghana and other things, they will come because of their currency is so strong, it's much stronger than Naira. They will come with uh, few money of their own, like SEPA, and they will buy a lot of things. So that is why we are having inflation. That is why we are having uh, put uh, scarcity. No one thing. So there will be that one. And by the time you open it also, other issues will come. That is the issue of smuggling and uh, maybe infiltration of other things that uh, happen, uh, given the corruption around our borders. Uh, okay. So we are likely going to see other things to also, uh, you know, increase smuggling, all sorts of, uh, you know, even banditry and others may likely uh, increase. But at the same time, we are going to see the business uh, booming. But like I said, it may not change things because of the fact that our currency is very, that is low. I mean, the value is very low. So that one will give them uh, advantage uh, because uh, they will come with their currency and uh, they exchange it and uh, they buy things cheaper as far as uh, what they are concerned. And here we are going to see the increase of the inflation. Speaking about our own currency, uh, down on the business NJ says Naira loses 30 Naira against the dollar weekly amid CBN's RDAS. Um, I don't know what that means because I would have thought that they were 
you know, doing something. We saw the, the you know, dollar go from about 2,000 2, naira to the dollar sometime in February. And then it came down to as low as 1,100. And all of a sudden, it started rising again. As of right now, we're looking at 1,006, uh, thereabouts. And we keep seeing this decline with our FX rates. So I'm wondering what the CBN is doing. But the final one I want to take here on uh, the business NG says, battle for River State. WK takes on PDP governors in fight for party supremacy. I want to get your take on what's happening in River State right now. You see, uh, what is happening in River State is unfortunate. Okay, uh, and uh, actually, uh, the political giants, uh, especially the federal government, is allowing this thing to, you know, get out of hand. We cannot allow people, just because of personal sin, uh, Wiki has come out and even threaten governors in other places that is going to speak fire in the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, now, that is going to uh, deal with them in their own state. You cannot have such reckless statement in, in a real democratic system. Well, the whole country to Aransom, and now talking about that one, certainly even his uh, uh, governors who are elected in their own state that is going to foment trouble there, and then you allow it. You see, this is what I'm saying uh, earlier on. When you now descend heavily on the poor people because they protest, they are hungry. This is somebody who is say, saying something. Actually, in other climb, what he's saying now will amount to like a treason. Why can you say you are going to uh, you know, create problems in other states and bring them down and so on? And yet you are a minister of Nigeria. He's not a minister of uh, you know, a local government. He's a Nigerian minister. And so he should mind what he says instead of coming out on personal basis. I'm not saying, I'm not supporting Pobara or any other thing, but we have to contextualize this thing and see that these are the kind of problems that led to the downfall of the First Republic, the Second Republic, and the cripple the Third Republic. And now if we don't head up, we will hear a problem here in uh, there, in rivers, in another place, and so on. Before you know it, it will now you know, they separate to other places and nobody knows what uh, is going to happen. Well, like you said, this is a threat to our democracy. And I mean, I think the federal government at this point needs to speak up and you cannot, are we even in competition with each other? Like if it's democracy, it's Nigeria as a whole. And I don't think one person should have such power um, over a state that you're currently not even the governor. But we'll be talking about Wiki um, and the, ri the river state political scene much later um, in the show. That's our second hot topic. But this is where we have to wrap it up here on this segment right now. Professor Kamili, thank you so much for coming. It's always a pleasure reviewing the papers with you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, sir. Have a nice day. All right, we're speaking with Professor okay. Camillo Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science at Bayoro University, Kano. And we've just been taking the headlines that made it to our national dailies this morning. We'll go on a short break. When we return, we're looking at our first hot topic. Well, this talks about uh, fuel crisis worsen as unpaid debt disrupts dis distribution, and that is by the NNPCL. Please stay with us.